but still uh, with uh, this definition applies. Vertex 2 is the same degenerator of 5 for the same region. There is a path that goes from 2, 6, 7, 8, 5. Now, the important thing to notice is that if we find the same domain of the vertex, then all the vertices that are on the tree path from the same domain of the vertex cannot be dominated because they are bypassed by this path. So this is the idea. It gives us an initial approximation. So I, I want to describe in detail the algorithm, but the heart of it is to find this, uh, evaluate this meaning. So we have a, so our, the idea is that we have a tree Every node on the tree has a value. And now we want to select three paths and compute the minimum value of these three paths. So for instance, if we want to compute the same denominator of D, then we explore this side from G to D. And we want to evaluate the minimum same denominator value computed so far in this path that goes from a child of the nearest common ancestor of these two arguments. So B is the nearest common ancestor of B and G. This defines a tree path from E to G. And we, and we have already computed the semi dominators of these vertices. Now we want to find which vertices, and which vertex of these vertices has the smallest semi dominator value. This is vertex C in this example, because the semi dominator of B is A. And all the other vertices have higher values. In order to compute this minima, we use this disjoint subunion structure with some augmentation to keep track of the values. So initially, all vertices are single sets. And then we start uniting sets as uh, these paths are computed. So at this point, all these vertices are in a single set. So we, keep, we just compute the minimum value in vertices that are in, that are in a single set. There are many de there are various details. I just wanted to convince you that it's a non-trivial app. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice, very nice algorithm. Not, not extremely complicated, but it has some, uh, some, complex, some conceptual com complexity that one has to know about in order to, uh, uh, to encode it, to, uh, to give an efficient code, uh, correct an efficient code. So now, depending on how we, uh, on the kind of data structure we use, we get two kinds of complexity. Either a, a log factor away from being optimal, asymptotically, or a linear cycle factor. Okay. Here's uh, some experiments about uh, comparing the iterative algorithm and the uh, character. Uh, so the green one, this one is a iterative algorithm. As you can see, it can keep up pretty well up to a point. So this is the size of the graph measured in number of edges. But and these are all uh, application graphs. So these are not artificial examples. After a certain point, though, we see an explosion in the organic time. So these are uh, this figure was courtesy of. Uh, Luigi, and I think this is seconds. This is seconds. Is seconds to normalize it for the number of edges. This is mean seconds. Mean seconds per edge. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, theory does work. You see here that we have a linear, uh, we have a constant, a constant amount of time spent for every edge. That's why. This is a flat line here. While the eternity needs to spend a lot of time for complicated graphs. Okay, so this is the fortunate scenario. So this is what we want to observe more and more in practice, that uh, algorithms that are superior in theory are also observed superior in practice. Okay. Now the, no, the point of, all, uh, of this example is that uh, Many practitioners still uh, uh, still want to use a simpler uh, algorithm that they understand, and this is something that we want to address: how to use efficient algorithms and make them available available to people who want to use them in practice. 
So an average stolen uh, slide from Alpine uh, Italiano. So let's see what happens in theory and what we observe in practice. In theory, we have number types, uh, the usual math types of so real or uh, uh, natural numbers. In practice, we have uh, finite precision. In theory, only asymptotics matter. This order is big O notation that we use. In practice, seconds do matter, and seconds are uh, affected by constants. So constants are hidden in our theoretical analysis, but we really want to, at the, uh, at the end of the day, when we do an implementation, we, want, we really want to know about them. In theory, we, uh, at, at least in modern theory, the theory of algorithms, we just give a high level description of the algorithm. In the, in, in the, old, in the older days, not so old days, uh, people used to accompany their uh, theory paper with some actual pseudocode or real code. And people were uh, more able to, uh, were able to immediately use the, the code, more or less. Actually, this was the case for the Lenkauer particle. But the actual code was given in an appendix, but still, uh, it, it doesn't make the it doesn't make the process very uh, completely. In practice, we want uh, when we're given a high level description of the algorithm, we have to face various uh, decisions that affect our implementation, and we'll see an example of that later. And of course, the decisions that we make may affect the uh, correctness of the algorithm if we don't think about the trade. And this is something that uh, a, a programmer might not be so good at, might, might not want to invest so much time to think about it. In theory, we have unbounded memory, unit access code, uh, post in practice. This is not the case. Now we have hierarchies, bandwidth. Uh, parameters to think about. And of course, in theory, uh, the usual uh, assumption is that we count elementary operations. And it doesn't matter if, if, uh, if the uh, quality, if there are different operations, we just count them for the same constant amount of time. In practice, of course, modern uh, computers are much more complex and uh, it's very hard to predict the actual random time of a unique, uh, like, uh, of a unique command. Uh, here are some examples, of, uh, but theory does work. Uh, and we have some examples of uh, algorithmic uh, products, so there are these companies that produce all, all these uh, sophisticated algorithms okay, for, for a variety of uh, problems. But uh, uh, usually now, oh, people refer to this process of implementing and fine-tuning algorithms as, uh, as uh, algorithm engineering. Okay, so this is actually an engineering question because you have to implement tests, and if it doesn't work, then you have to go back and uh, implement something different. So uh, if you want to give a sort of definition of what this process is, is the process of designing, analyzing, them, implementing and experimenting with algorithms. And uh, in this process, we also want to develop not only source code, but also methodologies to develop and to test algorithms. The end product that we hope to have is a library that people will be able to use. And of course, tests for a variety of problems. A, a, a big issue is that uh, the results that you someone experience is are reproducible so other users will have the same exact experience of using uh, the same algorithm on the same input on the same type of inputs so all, all these things help to get this effect so beyond going to actual source code that someone can use there are some other side outcomes that are equally uh, important of course, the, the end result we want to have is to transfer advanced technologies from theory to practice. 
And then we want to have people really get a feeling of what is the uh, performance of the algorithm in practice. So again, the observation is that constant factors do matter. Uh, for people who are more uh, uh, keen into working in theory, uh, experimentation also helps because we can test conceptions or propose new, new conceptions based on experimental evidence. And this is uh, uh, something, uh, something very nice and very important. And of course, uh, one would like to, uh, to use these experimental results to refine the analysis. So this is something so if we observe, observe a performance that is that it doesn't exactly match our uh, theoretical analysis, then this might give us a hint that there's something more to be done about this problem. Or maybe the model that we use is not the appropriate one. And again, I'll point to Luigi's talk tomorrow on most of the seizures. So th this problem, these seizures have been, although algorithm engineering is, some, is, uh, is a, uh, a term that I have heard uh, kind of recently, not so recently, but not, uh, but not, but it, at, at least in my experience hasn't been used for a long time. But actually, it has been of a, uh, of a need for engineering problems that have been observed some time ago before 2000. So, this is a seminal paper by, by this group of people that points out that. Uh, uh, we as a community, the, the algorithms community, has to help out so that uh, pro has to provide so that promising algorithms are not left into just a, a theoretical concept. So we have to help out so that uh, they are transferred into the practice of uh, using algorithms. And the process of this, uh, the central process is this circle. Uh, usually, when we talk about uh, theory of algorithms, we uh, talk about a cycle, uh, a cycle of two uh, stop, of, of, of two parts: the design and the analysis. Here, implementation experiments come in, into play. So, if we don't observe the appropriate, the, uh, the suitable, the expected efficiency in practice, then we have to go back and design something new, or try to understand what uh, what's happening what are the bottlenecks in our implementation. And hopefully after some work here, we'll get uh, solutions that have performance guarantees that, uh, are, uh, that uh, are both good in theory and in practice, and also give uh, ready-to-use libraries for people to apply. Now I want to comment about uh, algorithm libraries. We have to think about, uh, okay, so someone has implemented this very nice, very fast algorithm, took a lot of effort and time. Will we use it? Just put yourself into the position of someone who wants to run this new algorithm, to use it in, in, in his or her application. Will you be keen to use it? Uh, okay, I'll skip that. So what's the issue here? The issue here is, is it correct? How can we know? Okay, some, someone hands us uh, uh, some, some software, but it's supposed to be very, very good and uh, do the job really fast. But uh, where's the issue? How do we know it's correct? Of course, a designer has to make, uh, in, in theory, we don't care so much about stability and robustness. And these are things that uh, are affected by the kind of input, by per, per, uh, perturbations, etc. Uh, or we have to deal with uh, uh, the amount of data that uh, the algorithm is uh, uh, designed to handle. Or to exploit new architectures, is it designed to take uh, advantage of new, uh, new computer architectures? These are all important questions. So, uh, what makes algorithm engineering a very challenging area to work? Here's an example of the use of libraries. Uh, it's kind of an extreme example. I, I, so in reality, when we develop an algorithm, we want to use as much help as we want, as we can get. So uh, when implementing an algorithm, we might use uh, packages that have data structures. One of such packages in C++ is the standard template library. And 
we can implement the LEM power Tangent algorithm using this uh, library. And this is the performance we get with a naive use, uh, I have to point out, of such library. So we just, uh, whenever we need a, uh, an array, we use the standard deplated vector or uh, some, some, some link trees or something like that. And this is the performance we get when we use customized data structures. So this requires much more effort. This is more, uh, much easier to uh, produce. But there is a big gap in the performance if you don't pay attention. Okay. So these are all questions that we have to keep in mind. Now a few words, so this will be my final point, and hopefully I'll be on time, uh, about correctness. So again, think about a product, and we, uh, we want to use it. Uh, we have no way of actually trusting it. Like, like if we don't, uh, we have no reason to trust the developer. Approach, okay, it might be like uh, a company that uh, produces quality, uh, has produced software of some quality, but if uh, our application is critical, then we might need to, to have uh, some take some measures that we get the right result. So this is a big uh, question in uh, uh, both in theory and in software development. There are various ways to address this problem. So uh, again, the, the question is, we're given a program, we feed the input, and we get an output. How do we verify that the output is correct for the given input? Okay, so this is a, uh, this is a huge issue. There are formal ways of proving the program to be correct. So, like mechanical verification, but you actually uh, have, can have a computer prove that a given program is correct using uh, 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 using some groups of logic. But this is the use of it is rather limited right now. You can have program checkers, a program that is given the input and the output, and has the purpose of testing if the output is the correct one. Again, this is program specific. And it depends on the nature of the problem, how well the program checker can perform. But it's how easy it is to produce a program checker for a given problem. Ideally, we want the checker to be something very simple. Okay, because of course then we have the question: Is a program checker correct? And there is the last point about the certified algorithm. Cert uh, sorry, certified algorithm. Uh, so, what is a, uh, such an algorithm? Such an algorithm augments the output with some certificate of correctness. So, this is not, not a, a new uh, notion. I'll just prove it in a moment. And the point is that a verifier now can get both the output and the certificate and the input and can, can verify, verify very easily if the program is correct. So now the burden of proving that the output is correct is not placed on the checker, but is placed on the program itself, but has to produce a certificate. This is not a new notion. For instance, if we think about a very mentioned algorithm, the algorithm of uh, Euclid, so Euclid for computing credits from a uh, divisor, it's given by this very, uh, very nice reference. So this is the whole program. But think about, as a toy example, what happens if we have a program that computes the greatest common divisor between two numbers, and we want to test if this is the correct output. How to do that without recomputing the greatest common divisor? A way to do it is to augment it, to use this augmented uh, Euclid algorithm, but computes uh, factors of uh, some linear formula. Okay, I won't get into the details, but we can. There's a unique way to write uh, the greatest common divisor as a linear combination of the two numbers. So, uh, what we want to do is that we have a, a, we augment the algorithm so that it does not only produce d, but also the factors of this linear formula x and y. And now. Uh, given the output, we can verify that D is indeed the divisor of A and of B, 
and also that it uh, satisfies this linear relation. And if it does, then we will ensure that uh, the computation is correct. So the same idea holds for many other algorithms. So for instance, if you think about shortest paths, okay, this is a very classical network optimization problem. We're given a direct or undirected graph with some uh, weights on the edges, say that they represent distances. We have a start vertex, and we want to compute the shortest distances to all other vertices. For this instance, they're given by its red arc. How do we verify that this computation is correct? Again, it's a problem specific. It's elementary here. We, uh, we don't even need a certificate. All, it, all, all we need to do is to test that the triangle equality holds. So if we have the distance to u and the distance to v computed, then and the existence of an arc from u to v implies that this inequality must hold. The reason is that if the distance to, to v is larger, then we can improve it by going through u. Okay, so this is a self, so any algorithm that computes shortest paths when they are no negative signs from appropriate for the one to know, is a self certified. Maximum flow, another class of problem in you know, network optimization. Again, a direct graph with a source. This time we have a, a, a sink, a target vertex. Every edge has a capacity, and now we want to compute the flow, which is a function on the edges that satisfies these uh, three requirements. Capacity constraint, that the flow that goes through an edge satisfies its capacity, is less than its capacity. So you see here two numbers on each edge. The first one is a flow, the second is a capacity. Here it's zero, the flow is zero, capacity is 10. So the first number should be smaller than the second. Two symmetry. It's a technical uh, requirement. If uh, if we think that x sends some flow to y, then it's equivalent from x to receive the same amount from y. So y sends a negative flow to x. And finally, conservation. No other intermediate node except for s who sends the flow and p who receives the flow is allowed to store the flow. And now, if we the goal is to compute the maximum flow. And the maximum flow can be witnessed by shortest, uh, uh, by mean cut. I won't get into details, I'm just refreshing the memory with this example for people who are acquainted with it. Uh, so, again, we can make very easily a flow computation certified. So, there's a way to produce, just uh, to put some final notes, there's a way to make the dominator computation. Certifying, and uh, more on more on that, you can take a look at uh, Nico's poster, and it also contains uh, a nice uh, set of open problems. So that's why we didn't mention any the open problem session. You can find them in the poster. Okay, I, I don't have time to go through this, but you can. Uh, but I'll refer to Nico's talk about it. Some closing notes, since already. Time to end. So, uh, algorithm engineering is something uh, useful because it is something useful uh, both for theory and for practitioner because it combines both worlds. And we want to, to make good theory applying to practice. It can motivate deeper theoretical work. And in the process, this is part of our experience with this area, is that in the process of implementing our algorithms, we that we are very often able to find simplified versions. So this is a very nice scenario when it happens. So you find, so we simply, if you can simplify your algorithm so that it has the same performance guarantee and perform better in practice, so this is something very desirable outcome. And as a final note, I want to not, uh, I want to remark that uh, this is an area that has, uh, in my in my opinion, some uh, it's very promising. So very. Of many fundamental problems that people uh, still uh, are working on, and we really want to get really good solutions. 
both in theory and in practice for them. So it's a, uh, it's pretty much a new topic. Uh, according to, uh, as far as I know, many uh, several universities, particularly in Germany, have included the uh, algorithm engineering as a basic course in their uh, in their engineering or computer science. So thank you very much for your attention, and I want to acknowledge Vito Italiano, Rich Lara, Vito Sparzis, and Bob Tarzan for sharing this their uh, ideas throughout this uh, research. Okay, thank you. Okay, so are the questions from the students? Curiosity? This slide, which we which Lucas borrowed from Dino, has a very interesting predecessor, which he didn't borrow for some reason, but there's a saying who says, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, the, the, the there's nothing, then we know. Yeah. There's nothing more practical than good theory. No, there's this one. One statement, but this one is on his own page. He says, in theory, something doesn't work, and we know why. Uh, yeah. In practice, something doesn't work. work. No, something works, and we don't know why. And in software engineering, nothing works, and nobody knows why. Yeah, I, I can't reproduce inside of it. Yeah, that's additional. <laughs> okay, so I think that we can thank you being the speaker and uh, move to the next session.